sorry. I can move it back if I no, need to. No, Forget. Technology is wonderful, but it also dictates how we do things nowadays. <coughs> you mentioned something I thought was interesting. You said, and this is a question that Christians will often grapple with. Does the Old Testament have any application to us today? That since you know, Hebrews comes along and says, in times past, God spoke through prophets and, and uh, different spokespersons, but in, in our time, he's spoken through his son. But of course, you realize that scripture connects these two because it says that Yeshua, Jesus, was the living word, that he embodied what the word says. I'd like you to turn to Exodus 17, and you're going to see how, in so many ways, the people back then act just like us. <laughs> because people have always been kind of the same in some ways. And this is a short chapter. What I'm always surprised is how apropos scriptures written 3,500 years ago are today's, to today's events. <clears throat> And I'm going to read this whole chapter. It's a short one. If you remember, last time we talked about the fact that they had wandered through the desert for three days, didn't have water, came to Mara, went to drink the water, so bitter they couldn't drink it, they complained. God told Moses to throw a tree in the water, made the water sweet, and they were able to drink. And then the Lord said, if you'll obey everything I tell you, in Hebrew it says, if you shema, shema, uh, that None of the diseases of Egypt will fall on you. And based on the fact that pretty much all those diseases have fallen on us for 3,000 years, we probably didn't miss it very good. But now we start again in this chapter, and we, when you're in the wilderness, one of the challenges that you face is water. In fact, if you look at where we live today, one of our biggest challenges, biggest needs is water. In fact, I think the whole valley has breathed a sigh of relief to know that Vegas has decided, at least for now, to leave our water alone. I always laugh when I think about the fact that we hardly have enough to keep the few of us here going and someone wants to come and take it. But that's also very good. Exodus 17, verse 1. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of Sin, according to the command of Yahweh, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to Yahweh, saying, What shall I do to this people? Little more, and they will stone me. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel. And because they tested Yahweh, saying, Is Yahweh among us or not? Now, many of you will notice that this story sounds a lot like another story. In fact, some scholars think it's the same story. But I, how many of you notice in this story something that tells you it's not the other story? In the other story, what was Moses supposed to do to bring water from the rock? He was supposed to speak to it. Oh, oh this time, yeah, he's striking it. Yeah, yeah that was trouble. Said. Yeah. He struck this one because he was told to. The other one, he was told to speak to it, and he struck it again. And so there are two different stories, even though Masa, Masa, and Meribah are the names, which just means struggling, wrestling, fighting. And now, in verse 8, then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So not only did they not have water, Moses gets the water, and then Amalek attacks them. And the interesting thing is, Amalek is not Israel's enemy. Israel has done nothing to Amalek. 
They just attacked them. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Who in Scripture has the name Joshua? Several people do, but this Joshua is an Ephraimite. He's of the tribe of Ephraim. But the famous Joshua is of Judith. And I don't know how many of you, I, I am embarrassed to say how old I was when I found out that the name Jesus is Joshua. <laughs> and it, it's a little puzzling why we call Jesus Jesus and not Joshua when you think that we call Isaiah Isaiah and Jeremiah Jeremiah. We don't call him Isaiah and Jeremiah. It's, it's one of those, it, it actually I think has prophetic meaning. In any case, when Joshua is to go out and fight. Joshua did as Moses told him. He fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about that Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Anybody here ever held your hands up for five minutes? <laughs> Try it. Try holding your hands up for five minutes. What were you going to find out? It, you get tired. It, I mean, when I think of Moses holding his hands up all day, I get tired thinking about Moses. So when he held his hand up, Israel prevailed. When he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial, and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, Yahweh is my banner. And he said, Yahweh has sworn, Yahweh will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. My first reaction to this is, what? Why, why are we blotting out the memory of Amalek forever? And these are the kind of things when people read them in the Old Testament, they go, oh. Why did God say that? Was, it, was he having a bad day? <laughs> go to Deuteronomy 25. Talks about this again. Actually, what we're going to show you this morning is that Amalek is still alive today. And not only is it alive, how many of you appreciate the sense of the spirit of our nation right now? Would anybody describe it as peaceful? As friendly? as whole. So really, it may be that you want to blot out the memory of Amalek too. Deuteronomy 25. Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out, of e out from Egypt. How he met you along the way and attacked among you all the stragglers at your river when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall come about when Yahweh your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land which Yahweh your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. So we've got these two places. Blot out the memory. I'll just give you a little thing to think about. It doesn't say blot out Amalek, does it? It says blot out the memory. Now it is a bit... I mean, we're going to look at something else. 1 Samuel 15. In Deuteronomy, it describes some things that we didn't see in Exodus. In Exodus, it just says out of nowhere, they attacked them. But in Deuteronomy, it tells us that Amalek preyed on Israel. That it looked for the defect, it looked for the weakness, it looked for the sick, the straggler, and attacked them. It looked for the weaknesses and attacked. 
Something about this God hated. Now in 1 Samuel 15, then Samuel said to Saul, Yahweh sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself up against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. And do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. This is one of those things you're right. Because this isn't a memory, this is Amalek. Saul destroyed all of Amalek except King Agog <coughs> and the best of the livestock. How did God like Saul doing everything he was asked except sparing the livestock and the king? What happened to Saul as a result of this? He lost the kingship. This is one of those stories I just want to sit down with the Lord and say, what is going on here? It's a lot easier to spiritualize this one than... In any case, Saul's job was to eliminate Amalek that was living there. And, and, and it is a difficult thing to appreciate. I will mention something that might help you a little bit. If you look at the way God's people live and work together, it's very similar to our body. And your body survives by recognizing what's good, what's okay, what isn't, and destroying it. See, what kills us with the virus is the inability to kill the virus. The virus comes in, it replicates in our cells, and usually we mount an immune response, antibodies, while something called cell-mediated immunity, you usually need both, and over a couple of weeks, three weeks, we kill it. We never make peace with it. If you make peace with the virus, you're sick. Now, I kind of have made peace with one. It's called herpes. But luckily, it doesn't show up anymore. Anybody here, whenever you get sunburned or get a fever, you get a cold sore? Why? Because there's a virus in you that does something we call recrudesce. That's just a fancy word that means it's dormant, something stimulates it, and it comes back and attacks you again. My whole point is this. Your body doesn't make peace, peace with viruses because a virus alive in you will kill you. It's the same thing with cancer. So Greg was having us pray for people today, which is something the body's called to do. We're to pray for each other, to lift each other up. Well, somebody who a lot of you know is a fellow named Brad Scott. He's a wonderful teacher, tremendous sense of humor. And he'd been battling a brain tumor for a while, and they thought things were going along quite well. Just this week, he was speaking, had a seizure, had to go home. By the time he got home, he almost was not coherent. And his tumor is the size of a pear. Mm. And he's on hospice care, and he probably won't survive. Now, the Lord can heal him. I bring this up because if... His body did not want that tumor to grow, but it didn't have the means to destroy it. Amalek was something inside Israel that's like a tumor. God said it can't be there. There can't be a spot of it. It has to be removed. And this is something that, that bothers modern sensibilities because there's a modern idea that you can we can tolerate everything, and you can't. There are things if you tolerate them, you'll die. And so you have to find out, why, why is God so strong about the memory of Amalek cannot be amongst his people? I would like to uh, remind you again what God says, or actually this is what Moses is saying to the people. And he says, remember what they did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. How they met you along the way and attacked you, all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary, and you did not fear God. In other words, Amalek looked at Israel, assessed the situation, and said, how can I hurt them where they're vulnerable? How can I get them where they cannot respond? And God says, I hate this. 
And I'm going to point something out. If you look at Deuteronomy 25, where this is just above it, it has another troubling passage. How many of you like the concept of levirate marriage? How many know what it is? What's levirate marriage? There's a great movie that Hollywood put out about it. It's when a man dies, his brother is responsible to raise up offspring for the brother that died. Now this was extremely important in Israel. And I always wonder if they actually ever did this. I'm thinking, isn't there, could we just give them money? Or maybe one of my kids I don't like, I could give that one. Boaz did it. Boaz did it. Yeah, Boaz, Boaz actually did. Mary, the, the story of Boaz is a little easier to handle. But I want you to listen to something. This is in the same chapter in Deuteronomy. When brothers live together, this is Deuteronomy 25.5, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother and listen to this terminology so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. We're to blot out the memory of Amalek. We are not to allow the name of our brother to be blotted out. You start to see, this is one of the things that helps you when you study the Old Testament, go see how the sages look at it, because they have a lot more time to look at it than we have. And you realize when Yeshua taught, this, is, this was his background. This is where he came from. And so the sages are looking there saying, well, one says, block this out forever. The other one says, don't let this happen. And they go, oh, look at the difference. In the elaborate marriage, the brother is watching out for his family. He's taking care of his family. The other one is saying, this isn't my family. I'm looking for the weakness so I can destroy it. And God says, I want one blotted out forever, and the other one I want preserved. And so if you think that I am going to recommend elaborate marriage, I'm not. Uh, will that, when Yeshua is reigning on his throne, he can tell us how this works. Because, wow. I like, again, I can actually see why this worked back in those times, at least at some level because they didn't have any way that people could be taken care of. They didn't. If a woman did not have a husband, a father, or sons, she was at great risk in Israel. Not Israel, the whole world. In Israel, actually, they were at the least risk because they had mechanisms to take care of her. Now, this word blocked out is mechal. And it's to stroke or rub, to erase. It's translated abolish, blot out, destroy. And I was thinking about this. Something else that's significant in this story. How was Joshua was the one who fought the battle, but was Joshua able to beat Amalek by himself? What did he have to have with him? What happened when Moses' hands came down? Have you ever thought about that? And who held up Moses' arms? Aaron and who? Her. And her is an interesting biblical character for this reason. We don't know who he was. We have two ancient beliefs in who he was. One, what is that he was the son of Miriam, Moses' sister or that he was Miriam's husband. In any case, it is family that's holding up Moses' hands. The picture seems to be God loves family. He loves relationship. And he abhors this tearing down, this division that happens.
I think it's difficult sometimes for us as people because, especially in the natural, if I were to ask people who won the battle against Amalek, they would say Joshua and the troops. But the Bible includes this story of Aaron holding his, of Moses holding his hands up. So we'll know that that's not the whole story. In fact, it says quite plainly that when Moses' hands came down, what happened to Joshua? He was defeated. So there's, there's an element of connection or community in the story. And we can look at Amalek as someone who sees vulnerability and attacks. And then we can look over here at the brothers, when one brother dies, the other one sees the vulnerability and feels the need. It's a very different approach. And, and one of the things we don't realize in our world today is that we've become so polarized that everyone spends their whole life building up their side and destroying the other side and then wondering why they hate living in this mess. It creates a constant sense of controversy, a constant sense of contention, of rivalry, of factions. And lots of interesting things in the picture here. But we see something else similar to this in the story of the spies. When the spies are sent into the land, we always call them spies, but did you realize in Numbers, the word they're given to go in the land is, oops, I've got it here someplace, let's see. It's tour. They were to go see, to explore, to behold the land. But when Moses describes this in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy he uses a word that has the root regal or merglim, and this means it has the sense of also to look, but it's to be a tail bearer. Do you see how different it is to go look at the land to see how good it is versus to go look at the land to say what you saw wrong with it? We respond very strongly to this. And one of the things that we've lost the ability to tell is that if we constantly rehearse what's wrong with someone or some situation, we'll come to a day where we believe nothing about this situation or this person is redeemable or good. And it becomes the memory of Amalek. We know these New Testament scriptures, and we're not quite sure how to apply them. 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of the Messiah. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. If someone came to you and asked you, what does it mean that our warfare is not in the flesh? What does that mean? I mean, does that mean Joshua doesn't need to fight? And yet, would Joshua win without the spiritual side? He wouldn't. And yet, I think we'd have to admit with Yeshua, do you remember what Yeshua said to Pilate? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if it were, then would my followers take up swords and fight. How do we oppose what's wrong in the world? How do we help the world and not fight against the flesh? Now, I'll read you another one while you're thinking about that, because I'm really interested in what you think. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against what? Flesh and blood. What does that mean? What does that mean? 
Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. How many of you have noticed what's going on in our country right now on several fronts? We have this virus that's circulating around, and in case you didn't know, it's kind of making that fancy word I used, recrudescence. It's coming back into uh, much more prominence. Yes. And then we also have, for lack of a better term, what I'll call a race war. And what I've noticed about both of these is the extreme dearth, paucity, lack, absence of people who speak to these issues in a way that bring us together. We speak to the issue that divides this side from that side. And consequently, we're just angry. And one of the things you'll notice is when you're always speaking against something, you're looking for the vulnerability. You're looking for what, how you can take them down. Now, I, I enjoy sports. But I've noticed what, one thing the uh, epidemic pandemic did for me is I found out I can live without them because I don't have them. They probably aren't. But what do you... When the Jazz play an opponent, they send a scout to look at the team they're going to play. What is that scout looking for? Strengths or weaknesses? Weaknesses. Why? They're going to exploit them. That's because the Jazz, whether, whether it's the Lakers or the Blazers, whoever it is, that is their opponent. They want to defeat them. They don't want to build anything. They want to win. If you and I think that our walk with Yeshua is winning, we're headed for a disaster. We, ought, we do want to win against evil. But Paul has been very careful to tell us we are not winning against flesh and blood. Because the minute you start to fight flesh and blood, then you've got to go into this jazz mode. And you see, if you play the Lakers, any team that plays the Lakers, and everyone should know that LeBron plays on the Lakers. If you don't, you do now. You should never forget that. <laughs> and so does Anthony Davis. I'm joking, of course. But if seriously, if you play the Lakers and you don't have a game plan to at least Reduce the impact of LeBron and Anthony Davis, you're going to get what? <laughs> Destroyed. And so when you make a game plan, you look, what can we do to LeBron that will make him less effective? What can we do with Anthony Davis? Break his knee. <laughs> Sweet. And seriously, I mean, and I, I think we understand this. When, when you're playing a, an opponent in sports, that's what you do. You look for where they're strong, and you try to reduce that strength. You look for where they're weak, and you exploit it. Do you realize we're doing this to each other as Americans now? We're looking for the strength so we can bring them down. We're looking for the weaknesses so we can exploit them and destroy. It's an unhappy, unhealthy place to live. And it is the spirit of Amalek. The thing that sits back and says, you know, I have absolutely no reason to attack them, but I think I will. And while I'm at it, I'll get the stragglers and the weak, because if there's anything I can do to make their life miserable, that's good. Oh. You see this in nature all the time. When a wolf pack comes to a herd of caribou, are they herds? What are groups of caribou? I'm not up on all my groups. I've been learning. I think... An unkindness or a ravens, I believe. Crows are a murder. <laughs> Baboons are a congress. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love words? But a herd of caribou, I think. Seriously, when a wolf, when a, when a pack of wolves comes to a herd of caribou, what do they look for? They look for a weak one and an isolated one. 
The danger we have when we behave to each other the way we are now is we isolate each other. We put ourselves into groups. Where's the strength? I, I think every child growing up should know the Aesop's fable. Maybe you know it. How many of you know the story of the father who had seven strong sons who were always fighting? You know that story? Yes. Kids are looking at me with that vacant look. <laughs> Okay, what did the dad do? He was getting old and he knew he wasn't going to be around much longer. And his, he told his son over and over, stop fighting, so he said. All right? And he got seven green saplings, strong saplings. And he tied them together with buckskin and he gave them to each one of his seven sons to break. Well, there's no way in the earth they tried breaking these seven sticks, and they couldn't. Over their knee, over a rock, they could not break them. And he says, I can break these. And they said, no way, Dad. He untied them and snapped them one by one. <laughs> what was he telling his boys? <laughs> if you didn't know that story, your education is limited. <laughs> it's funny, the stories we know and that we don't know. But seriously, if, if the dad was telling the boys, if you stay as a group, if you stay family, even we'll go to the lever of marriage, we don't, there are things about that that bother us. What we do love is the idea that the family's going to gather around the defect and fill it. They're going to take care of each other. They're going to see each other as family. And here's the thing. When we see each other as family, when we see a defect, we're thinking, how can we heal this? How can we rebuild it? If we're looking at each other as opponents, like the Lakers and the Jazz, we see a defect, how can we exploit it? How can we make it worse? It, it's fine for Jazz, for basketball teams to do this. It's not good for people who are trying to build a nation, build a church, build community. It's, it's a very unhealthy situation. Paul says something in Romans 8. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? I want you to think about something. When you really love somebody, when you see them as family, and you see there's a problem, you immediately become consumed with the idea of how can I strengthen this? How can, maybe I can fill in the gap so something bad doesn't happen. When you look, have you ever noticed that there's a part of us that's certainly not the Holy Spirit, that when we hear something bad has happened to our enemy, we rejoice. <laughs> I always loved the picture of David, who was such a fierce warrior. And Saul had been chasing him for 20 years. And when he found out that Saul had died, he wept, and he says, don't tell this in Gath, don't tell it in Ashkelon. These are the cities of his enemies. And I don't know, it's difficult because you do have to be able to address things. If you're a teacher and you never tell people, I'm definitely one of these people that says, give kids tests, find out what they know. And it's because I know myself. If you never test me, I'm not going to learn it, because why? But if I'm going to get a test, and you're going to do this awful thing of assigning me a grade, well, then I'm going to show you. <laughs> and, and we're all maybe a little different, and you can mishandle this. But a teacher has to be able to say, no, Columbus is not the capital of Utah. It's not mean. It's just wrong. And yet, 
Have you ever noticed that someone that is for you, does God ever discipline his children? It tells us he does. And yet, Paul is reminding us that God is for us. He's our champion. And I, I think when you find out, one of the things they've noticed about kids, this is particularly boys with their fathers, but I'm sure it applies across the board, that most boys, whether they're in a game or performing in a play or music, if they look out and see dad, they'll do better. Because they look out and they go, there's somebody out there. And it could be the same with mom. I know in my case it was very much that way too. They go, you know what? No matter what I do, there's somebody there that's for me. There's somebody that's going to think what I did was worthwhile and it was good. And it will enhance the performance. Now if your relationship with your parent is one of contention, that's not going to work that way. It is essential to human beings to know that there's a champion in their corner. And that's what scripture is about. But now it also is calling us to be the champion for each other. And this can be hard when people are opposed to us. How many of you would think if you were Stephen and you were being stoned that you would look at the people that were stoning you and you'd see them as family and you'd say, don't lay this to their charge. I, I care about these people, and I, I don't want them to be responsible for that. I mean, I'm going, these people are stoning me. Nuke them. You know, really, let's be honest. What, what's happened to Stephen? Why is he saying that? Why is Yeshua on the cross, and he says, lay not the sin to their charge? We tend to think that it works in these biblical situations, but then we come to politics in the U.S., and we think it works to hate, to exploit, to dig. And I can tell you it's not working. It's not, I, I'm to the place I don't even like the news. And I'm kind of a news kind of a person. And I was looking at some things on Facebook because they are so uplifting. And somebody had written, John Bolton asked China to help Trump win re-election in 2020. Whether or not you think that's true, I don't care about that. But this fellow wrote back, I hate this blank. He single-handedly caused more blank, put his blank in a rifle squad in Afghanistan. And here's the thing I would point out to you. He doesn't know John Bolton. John Bolton doesn't know him. But we've created an atmosphere where being hateful is cool. It's not. It's unhealthy. Even if you complete, I, one of my favorite stories was Len Evans. And he, how many of you remember Len? He was here several times. Before he, around the Christian world, he was known as the Apostle of Love. You know, when, when he had his baptism of the Holy Spirit, it just transformed him. And he loved everyone. I had several long talks with him. Super smart guy. He, you, you didn't realize it. And a PhD from Princeton, and I mean, if you you could find out that that was there, but really, but he loved people, and, and, and their church was in Ohio, I believe. They were getting ready to have a retreat up to Canyon, and they had a caretaker up there, and the delegation from the church went up there to start getting it ready, and it just so happened that the leader of the delegation was black. Well, the caretaker wouldn't let him in. Len Evans went up there and was so angry, he flayed and filleted that person for what they had done. Because, and, and you know what? I agree with him. Racism, discrimination on the basis of skin color is always wrong. But he says, you know, I was right, and I had destroyed any chance that I'd ever have a relationship with that person again. He said, I would not do it that way. Can you understand that we don't have to be Amalek? We don't have to destroy the weak, the hurting. You realize somebody with this attitude is a very injured person. We can't stand for their actions. We have to stand against them. 
I mean, let me tell you, my parents loved me. They were my champion. They were for me. But there were certain things that I was not allowed to do. And sometimes it got violent because that was before child abuse. <laughs> but, but seriously, this, this whole dynamic, the Lord is asking, we're going to be a city on a hill. We're going to be a light. And I don't like what's happening. And I, I think it's amazing that God comes along and he says, the memory of Amalek. The way that Amalek works to destroy, to pick the weakness, to exploit the flaw. You know, if you find out your opponent can't do this, then, you know, it's just like when the Jazz played the Rockets last year in the playoffs. The Jazz had done really well all year, and then they only won one game out of five. And you know what they had done? They had watched Joe Ingles, who was so important to the Jazz offense, but they discovered he didn't do well going to his right. He's left-handed. He could do anything with that ball going to his left. You know what they did every time he got the ball? Pushed him to his right. That's good tactics in basketball. <laughs> It's not good tactics in life. To make yourself look better. And you know, I wrote some other stuff down. The Obamas were the creators and starting point of all the division and anti-American chaos we're witnessing in America today. <laughs> I have problems with the truth of that statement, but read it. I'm not so I I'm saying, why are we saying things like that? You, have to ask, you actually have to ask the Holy Spirit to tell you, you know what? This conversation is about destroying. It's about tearing down. It's uh, the COVID-19 fraud perpetrated by the globalists is worldwide, folks. Now, this is my favorite one. Cow's milk is a symbol of white supremacy. <laughs> You're laughing. You're, that's my the way I make a living. Uh, and I hope you understand what I'm saying. These, these, people are saying these things, whether they're true or not, or half true is not the point. It's perhaps, Lord, how do we, you know, there are things, there are things we oppose. I'll, I'll be honest, I oppose racism. I hate racism. But I don't like blowing stuff up either. I, and I, what I really hate is when we go on a protest for racism and we destroy black businesses and kill black cops. What, what is that? It's what happens when we have the spirit of Amalek. When we, the anger, it builds up and it just boils out and it destroys. And, and the thing is, is how is this going to be healed? What, how do we get that spirit out of us? How do we become for each other? And it's not always easy. In John 14, Yeshua said something to his disciples, and I bet you all can quote this when I start reading it. If you love me, you will what? You'll keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And I bet most of you can tell me, what's the Greek word that's uh, translated helper here? Starts with a P. Paraclete. Paraclete. Paracletos. Oh, yeah. Okay. And we typically, what's really the best translation for that, there probably isn't one because like often happens in a language, a language describes a culture and, and there's not a perfect synonym. But it's, a paraclete is an advocate. And Yeshua is telling them that I'm going to send you someone who's for you. Someone who's in your corner. Someone who's going to fill in what's lacking in you. Paul makes this comment in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. 
but especially that you may prophesy. And I think a lot of people read this and they think, I'm not a prophet, how, how can I prophesy? Do you believe we should keep the scripture? In the scripture, I hear, hear me really clear. The scripture says, I wish that you would prophesy. I especially desire that you would, not wish. For one who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands, but in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in the tongue edifies himself, so it's a very good thing. Believe me, if you're going to edify others, edify yourself first. But one who prophesies edifies the church. What does prophecy do? What is When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, what do we do? We edify, exhort, and console. This means which one of those words fits looking for the defect in my enemy and exploiting it? I, no. That was easy. It doesn't fit there. And I feel kind of bad because in a lot of ways I've got friends who think that it's spiritual to tear down the opposition. But all it does is make us mad. I don't have any problem with people articulating what they're for and what they believe in. In fact, we desperately need that because we've kind of lost our way in terms of right and wrong and, and all the rest. But if you and I, if Paul has exhorted us to prophesy, and then he says, this is what prophecy looks like. It edifies, it exhorts, it consoles. Now the word edify is oikodon in Greek, and all it means is a building. And everything, how many of you know this is an edifice? A building, right? To edify is to build. And so we have the Holy Spirit to build. This is the antithesis of Amalek. Amalek destroys. That's the wolves going after the caravan. That's, you know, looking for the sick one, the one that's straggling, the one that somehow gets separated off. No, not, this is not what building. That exhortation is actually the Greek word paraklesis. That just comes from that advocate, support, helper, comforter, all those things. And then consolation is a word paramuthia, which means to consult. You know, when somebody's sad, how many of you know when you're sad? You usually don't need a pep talk. I, you know, it's funny. I think men are particularly brain dead this way, and I may think this is because I'm particularly brain dead. Maybe other men aren't. But I can always remember when Joy and I were going together. How many of you as men know noticed that women cry more than men? <laughs> men still cry, and there's nothing wrong with it, even though when I was seven, I made this vow, I will never cry again. Dumb vow. Get rid of that. But women cry more. How many of you know that we men don't know what to do when women cry? Oh, it's okay. Don't do it. I'll swim the moat. I'll, you know, I'll slay the dragon. What is it you need? Don't cry. We don't know how to handle it. You know what? When somebody's sad, just be sad with them. It's okay. It, it's kind of funny that, uh, that we struggle with this. And, and Paul says that to prophesy when someone is sad, when someone is hurt, you can just be there with them. You can just identify with their pain. This whole concept of being builders, of being family, and I think that's one of the things that I also have noticed about Scripture, is how strongly it talks about this family motif. God's a father, Yeshua is the son, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the church, Israel, is his bride, that there's, there's always this, that, that we're his sons and daughters, there's this family relationship, and you'll notice that family is probably the most powerful uniting bond that we see in scripture. And what we're trying to do today, you know, it's like there's this, and maybe I should have brought it, but I don't want to make people mad. 
But there's a thing circulating on Facebook and other social media. It's called the divorce. And this person goes along and they list all the reason that they can no longer be identified with this part of America because they're just too far gone. The problem is when you get done with that, where are you? And it reminds me of Stephen looking at the people who are throwing stones at him and saying, don't lay this into their charge. Finally, Romans 12. And how many of you know that when you read the book of Romans, <laughs> Revelation, they do both start with R. <laughs> but in Revelation 12, Revelation is a tough book. I've mentioned to you before, I don't really know how to handle Revelation. There's so much of it that the symbolism and the uh, iconic the imagery, it's just, it's just hard to know exactly what it, it means because he starts off with saying, these things will soon take place. And I, actually, most of them look like they did, and yet it has, a, it has meaning for us today. But in Romans 12, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have come. Now, when did the salvation and the kingdom of our God come? When the Holy Spirit came. That's certainly when the Holy Spirit came. I, I, I could go for that. Here's my question. Is it in the future? In some way, maybe. But is it now? In the Lord's Prayer, what do we say about the kingdom? Yeah, so it, my point is that it might be hard to pin it down, that it's, it's a present reality and yet something that we may see more its fullness. But here's this verse in Revelation. The salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ have come for the, what happened? What made all that happen? that the salvation, the power, the kingdom, and the authority of the Messiah has come. For who has been thrown down? <coughs> Satan. Satan. Give me his name. The <laughs> accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. Have you ever stopped to think that the accuser of the brethren is the personification of Amalek? What does he... When Yeshua described the enemy, what did he say? He comes only to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Who does this describe? This describes Amalek looking at Israel thinking, we're going to get the stragglers, they're weak, they're thirsty, they're down, this is a good time to attack. But Revelation is saying that when that power, when that person is down, then the salvation of our Lord is here. And you all know the rest of it, we sing it in the song. Accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night, and they overcame him, what and how? Because of the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even when faced with death. I'm going to suggest, as we close here today, that we ask the Holy Spirit to shape how we're thinking about the world we live in. There is evil in our world. Evil needs to be resisted. Most of the time, God would have you resist the evil and not the evil person. It's not always easy, and I'm very careful to tell people what to do. You've all got your own Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, it was a, a thought that came to me as I was thinking about something like this. And certainly we do have an a overarching accuser, the, the enemy, the Satan, the you know, the devil, whoever you however you want to personify that thing of accuser. But then it, you know, I've been struck with this too, is that we can also put ourselves into a place, not the same place, uh, but we can but do, into, we can do his work of an accuser. And uh, you think about this one. Um, we have two ways to go. And the scripture points this out, that if we're not blessing people, if we're not upholding people, if we're not supporting people, then we are 
accusing them. And it uses even another word that we're cursing yeah. rather than blessing. And when we, when I think about it that way, that God forbid that I, you know, willingly and wholeheartedly take the point of an accuser. Uh, there are times when I pointed my finger at somebody, and in that way, I have taken the place of an accuser. And that is something that is stark. And then the Holy Spirit has to come and say, don't point your finger at that person. Don't accuse that person. Because that's not my will for you. No, and I think that's a great point you make, Ray, because we forget that yes, there is asatan, as the Jews like to say. There's this accuser. That's what Satan means. But that we can do him what? And I think that's what this whole passage about Amalek is. Don't be those people. Don't be the accuser. And, and it isn't that we don't confront evil. And I think it's interesting what, where we are right now in our country. We, we've had some things exposed with racism. We, we've had some things exposed with this whole virus. One of the funny things that's exposed with the virus is that scientists don't always know. And you, you need to be okay with that. What they first, how many of you noticed that what they first thought about this virus, they don't think that now? It's not because they're stupid, it's because when the evidence changes, you have to change your mind. And, and then we have this whole thing that's going on with racism. And we have, I have all kinds of good friends who are saying, well, there is no systemic racism. It's just, uh, they, they say things like, I never held slaves, I've never been racist. Uh, you know, I had nothing to do with this. And then other people that are saying, you have white privilege, white guilt, and, and we have this conversation where nobody's hearing. Everyone's attacking. And the problem isn't solved. The anger is still spilling out. And there have been some real powerful things that have been written. What I would say was going to help us as we move forward is how do I be for these people that I don't agree with and don't understand? How, how do I listen? You know, I find myself very torn. We're going around the country right now tearing down statues. And, you know, one, one of the sad things is they defaced the statue of a fellow who was probably one of the greatest heroes of abolitionism. They are in the East, forgot his name. Farm Lisa, anyway. Because they didn't know. It was a statue, so they destroyed it. And they didn't realize that this was a guy who gave his life for your cause, you know? And, you know, tearing down statues of George Washington and that. <laughs> How many of you know that if you take the Amalek viewpoint, you can find a lot wrong with everybody? <laughs> when George McGovern ran for president in uh, a while back, Seventy-two, wasn't it? I'm amazed I had a hard time remembering. It was the first time I voted. And I didn't vote for McGovern. But his first running mate was a fellow named Thomas Eagleton. And Thomas Eagleton was a man who had had some struggles with mental health. And so he'd gone through counseling. In fact, he might even have had some kind of shock therapy, but he was fine. He, everything was, but somebody found this out about him. They blew it up in the press and he had to sign off with the campaign within two days. And I can still remember at the time that I thought, you know, Eagleton, I don't agree with your politics, but this is so stupid. And what he, what happened, and, and what's more, what is wrong with having a problem? I, I was like, no, I don't. I was going to say I'd like to see the hands of everyone here who's never had a problem. But <laughs> there's something so wrong with looking somebody over and running them through a filter and trying to find something to destroy them. That's what's become our political system. It's not healthy. And I can tell you right now, we are headed for a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the first time by Biden ran and a few things that came up and. Boy, they're coming up again. I can depend on it because 
We have long memories and everything. How many of you know that one of the things that's really exposing our society is this little device? Because if you do something horrible, you say something horrible, it's there's somebody there recording it. Mm -hmm. Which probably is good in some ways. But as we bring this to a close, there is evil. There are bad people. We need grace to know how to oppose that. But this whole thing that looking at others to find what's wrong, to exploit and tear down, is not the spirit of Yeshua. What does it say about Yeshua? For every human being, is this true that he ever lives to make intercession? And it would appear that, just like Greg was saying, we don't need the accuser sometimes, we just take that role on ourselves, that we've been called to join him in intercession. I'm not really worried about what you think because I'm sure you're smart and you've come to your points of view that's fine with me. You need to come to those. How do we move together going forward depends upon this ability to forget and blot out the memory of Amalek. It, it's, a, it's a curse. It's a seed that destroys people. And we, I, I love what Paul says. I desire you all prophesy and prophecy will be edification exhortation and consolation. And there are different words you could use, but basically to build up, to protect, to be an advocate, and to weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laugh. It's a wonderful day to live. You know, it, it, I think sometimes we look at all the problems and we think, oh, what a terrible time to live. And some of the funniest memes on Facebook are the ones about 2020. <laughs> Because everybody thought the 2020, this is the year when we see perfectly. So far, it hasn't worked out. But it's a great time to live. Let's all stand. <laughs> Brother Ron, would you close for us, please? Lord, we just thank you for this word that and help us, Lord, to walk in such a way. Lead us by your Holy Spirit to walk in your word, Lord, and that we truly will not be joined with the accuser of the brethren. That we will be found walking with Yeshua, which came and died for all, which came and said that he came not to abolish, but to fulfill and to lift up and to strengthen you your word and your law in our lives. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we can walk in such a way that would glorify your name and that you would be lifted up. And we just give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.